<clears throat> first of all, I, I rarely say this. I've done a few of these as a moderator. I just absolutely loved this book. I couldn't put it down. So yeah. I'm starting by saying how wildly entertaining it is. Peter, and it thank shows, you. That's, that's really terrific. I, I really appreciate that. You can pay me later. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and your enjoyment in writing this, I think, showed. So my first question is in the, on the very first page, in fact, you say, that the other subjects of this series, of which there are 50 or so, I believe, um, have all been admirable and in a way heroic. Bugsy Siegel is hardly admirable. You also say a little later how seductive he was. So did he seduce you as you did your research and writing? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess there are two answers to it. First, why um, Yale University Press decided to do Bugsy, because as you say, they've had this wonderful series going, Jewish Lives, which is now up to, to 50 short biographies of all these distinguished people. Um, why Bugsy Siegel? And actually, I think it was our editor-in-chief, Eileen Smith, who, as much as anyone, who said, why not include a Jewish gangster? I mean, gangsters were part of the Jewish American experience in the late 19th, 30, 20th century. Um, shouldn't they be somewhere in this? And I just happened to be sitting next to Eileen at a dinner. I asked her what she was doing next, uh, looking for, she said, a writer for Bugsy Siegel. I said, I'm your guy, which of course was completely apocryphal because um, I, I had not written exactly about um, uh, casinos, but I had written, uh, Harry, uh, with Harry Belafonte, his memoir, uh, by the way, for Peter. Um, and uh, Harry's time in the casinos of Las Vegas was fascinating. So it was a world that intrigued me. I wanted to know more and I thought, let's do it. Um, so so that, that was the, the genesis. So there's so much to talk about here, really. This could go on for hours, I'm not kidding. Let's do it. The easiest way to sort of get through his life as comprehensively as possible. And by the way, you write much more than just about Bugsy Siegel's life. You, you write about the era and the sort of sociology of Bugsy and his criminal yeah. cohorts. So starting chronologically, let's start with the Lower East Side of New York, which is where he grew up. Um, and by the way, I will say one thing. I do have another connection, which I think we'll probably get to a bit later. Yes, but on the Lower East Side was a very famous Jewish dairy restaurant called Ratner's, um, where all these gangsters hung out. And my mother's family started and owned Ratner's. So um, there you go. So there are ties. But let's describe what life was like on the Lower East Side and how Bugsy and his best friend, another mm -hmm. gangster, came out of there. Well, sure. I mean, it was a dreadful, difficult, miserable life on the Lower East Side. And for the millions, literally, of, of immigrants who came from Eastern Europe, as, as Bugsy's did, um, it, was, um, uh, it was really hard. They, first of all, most of them only spoke Yiddish. Um, uh, they were subject to enormous um, uh, prejudice. Um, uh, Ben's, I should say Ben, we, we have to get used to calling him Ben Siegel. Uh, if you call him, if you called him uh, Bugsy, you, you might not survive the encounter. Um, but Ben um, saw what his father, uh, how his father had ended up. He worked in a, in a factory as a pants presser uh, for pennies a day. And um, uh, Ben was just not going to do that. He was not going to let himself have that kind of life. So he he kind of went out into the streets by the age of 10 or 11 years old, and he was doing all the sort of petty crimes that kids did down there, um, you know, uh, threatening uh, pushcart peddlers unless they gave him a little money every week, threatening to, 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 to engage in arson. Um, and uh, uh, at one of these occasions, uh, when he was maybe 14 years old, um, he, he was involved in some sort of confrontation and was was holding a gun and um, uh, a, 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 a young gangster who was sort of observing this uh, pulled Ben aside and said um, uh, what are you doing the police are about to come around the corner get rid of that gun so the guy did and the two became close friends and that guy was Meyer Lansky 
And Meyer Lansky and Ben Siegel were the best of friends all through the rest of their lives until the very end, which I, I gets us just a little ahead of the game for a second. There is some speculation still that the guy who shot Ben uh, on June 20th, 1947 uh, through a, a window in a house in uh, Beverly Hills, that person may have been Meyer Lansky. So it's a fascinating bromance. Uh, Which that will. would put a damper on a friendship, I would say. <laughs> so, um, you know, these guys, um, they, they were great partners together because uh, Meyer was actually sort of short and um, uh, he, he, he was brilliant actually at numbers, uh, but he was a very controlled, careful, uh, contained guy. Ben was the opposite, as his nickname suggested. So they, they kind of balanced each other out. And then came the event that completely uh, transformed their lives, Prohibition um, in 1920. And um, soon enough, these guys who are literally like 14 and 18 years old were um, protecting convoys of bootleggers at night and, uh, and, and doing things at the orders of uh, Arnold the, the Brain Rothstein. Um, and uh, just generally making a first fortune. That's what you they make did. the point, Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you make the point that I think is really interesting that a lot of normal business, the sort of climbing the corporate ladder was shut off to Jews in those days. Right. Um, and so the gangsterism in a way was their response to capitalism. Exactly right. That was really an yeah. interesting point. It was a point actually that Malcolm Gladwell made in an essay at one point. He, he used this phrase, the crooked ladder. Um, and his point was really, you're, you're making it, that um, these guys didn't come to America wanting to commit crimes. Um, the, the Italian mob, that was another story. <laughs> They'd been around for hundreds of years. They were proud of their malfeasance. The Jewish gangsters came uh, to the Lower East Side for the most part and they really couldn't get work unless they wanted to be pants pressers. So they really had to go out and commit the crimes that they did to establish themselves and to seize their piece of the American dream. And what's interesting is that um, a generation later, if you describe a generation as perhaps 20 years, um, nearly all of them were gone. Um, uh, as soon as they had had the opportunity to go legit um, and put their kids in good private schools, the whole ethos, the whole you know, generation of Jewish gangsters essentially evaporated. Well, there was another route there. I mean, you talk about all these different influences on Bugsy. Yeah. Sorry, Ben. Although I think if I was alive, then I would have had the nerve to call him Bugsy, by the way. <laughs> but um, one of the things that his father was an influence in, in a weird way, in a negative way, especially about money and the other relationship that is so interesting was Ben's brother who did yeah. take a different route out. Can you just sort of talk sure. about the two of them and how they they interacted with Siegel? Sure. Well, perhaps not unlike um, uh, criminal families, Jewish criminal families, um, the, the, the success story was the criminal, was the young guy who went out and did all the things that, you know, earned him a lot of money. And, and that was Ben in his family. And his, his, um, I spoke to one of his granddaughters who said that, um, you know, there was the perhaps inevitable conflict of feelings about this. They were happy to be getting money, but they were embarrassed about how it was coming into them. And as a way perhaps to atone for this or to um, uh, make himself uh, feel more uh, part of the family, uh, he put his brother Maurice through medical school, um, and the, the, the kids. There were there were five of them. Um, uh, three daughters started with Ben, then three daughters, and then Maurice. Maurice, the youngest, actually went to uh, medical school in L.A. He became a fairly distinguished uh, doctor and internist, I think. And um, uh, and 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 so, you know, when as his granddaughter said, when when they asked him about Ben. He was very um, closed mouthed about it. He admitted that Ben had put him through college, but he didn't want to say anything else. I think because he felt guilty about the fact that he'd, you know, he'd taken that money from his brother um, and yet, uh, you know, found him 
to be the uh, reprobate that he was. So prohibition comes, Ben Siegel becomes kind of insanely wealthy considering yeah. he's probably 21 or 22 years old at this point. Exactly, <laughs> living, literally living in a suite in the Waldorf Astoria by that point. Uh, and there's a funny moment when he, he liked to, to throw water balloons out the window. <laughs> he was a kook. And, <laughs> and at one point, Albert Anastasia turns to him and says, Ben, what are you doing? What are you doing with these water balloons? And he says, well, I liked it. I, I like it. I like throwing them down. Um, and uh, so, yes, he, he was a bit of a kook, um, but he was a very wealthy one. Um, and, uh, you know, that continued right through Prohibition. Um, but the problem was Prohibition ended and then they, they, they all had to kind of reinvent themselves. And how did he reinvent himself? Well, Meyer Lansky reinvented himself by going down to Florida and, um, you know, essentially taking over all the games down there, the, 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 the horse uh, races, the, the, the nightclubs. He, you know, he elbowed into all that stuff. Um, uh, but that left a whole other new territory for Ben, which was L.A. Um, and Ben, ben went out to L.A. literally just as, as Prohibition was ending. And the first call he made was to his dear friend, George Raft, the, the gangster turned actor um, who made his, uh, who had his big breakthrough in Scarface in 1932. Well, um, they had grown up in the same area. They had friends in common. And actually uh, what Ben wanted above all was to be an actor um, just like George. Um, so, uh, the, you know, there are very amusing details about how that, that worked for him. He, he literally went to the set of the movies that, uh, George Raft was making and he, um, he brought his own 16 millimeter camera and, uh, he had, um, uh, another actor film him saying the lines that George Raft had just said in the movie to show everybody what a great actor he was. It's crazy. And, as Raff later said, you know, he was pretty good. He, but, you know, imagine what would happen if he went in for a part, auditioned with some casting director and didn't get it. He'd, he'd probably be killed. Um, so instead of that, he concentrated on being sort of an actor manque. He, um, he went to this uh, great barber shop called Drucker's where you would, you know, just get the whole works every day. And then he would, you know, dress in some beautiful $200 uh, suit with a $25 monogram shirt and he would go out there looking like an actor looking like a you know man on top of the world but actually when you think about it it was a very um, effective um, method or effective means of getting the money that he was you know holding up all these nightclubs and racetracks and whatnot uh, with when you know when they saw this guy coming in like this he he was serious you know he he was um, he was not to be trifled with. Um, and, and the other thing he did um, when he first got there was to get involved with the race wire, namely the, you know, there, there was horse racing, horse racing was legal, but then there was this illegal horse ra race wire uh, business where they could actually run the, the information, the results of the race by telegraph up to bookies waiting somewhere else. And they could, um, you know, uh, make their profits uh, by doing that. And, and that was an enormously lucrative gig um, for Ben. So, so he did all that. He established a new life that way. And, um, uh, uh, and, 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 and he became so wealthy that he took it upon himself to build this enormous mansion up in Holmby Hills. Um, and actors like... Um, you know, Cary Grant and Frank Sinatra and um, uh, Jimmy Stewart would come to um, would come to the mansion and 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 would gamble and and have a fine time. Uh, although they began to notice um, that he would at some point sidle up to them and ask them for a loan, <laughs> and and indeed one after another of these actors was obligated to give Ben, you know, quite a few hundred dollars uh, with, the, with the pretext that, that, that some great project was happening, some restaurant he was gonna open or, or whatever. Um, uh, but this was also, you know, this was the, the, the LA of Chinatown. I mean, this was, this was, this was the thirties. It was incredibly um, uh, sort of lured at loose time. Um, 
and um, anyway, so that, a, that was- A judge once told me years ago, I'll never forget this, and reading your book really reminded me of this, that he said it started out that actors used to imitate the criminals and their mannerisms, but as gangster movies became more popular, the gangsters actually started imitating the actors playing gangsters, <laughs> which I thought was brilliant. great. And, I, wish I'd, I wish I'd had that in the book. That, that, that's <laughs> brilliant. Um, one of the things that um, I loved, and then I'm gonna ask you to tell one particular story. Sure. He, ben Siegel moved in to take over some unions. I think it was the extra union, extras yeah, union that he exactly. got involved in. And, yeah. um, but he was, he always went easy on the studio heads, basically, you said, because deep down he wanted them to hire him as an actor, which just really yeah. made me laugh. Yeah, yeah. So actually, mm. uh, uh, not as, as cold blooded a, a character as, as, as you might have thought. I wanna... Everybody wants to be in show business. Will, will you tell the Jimmy Stewart story? It's just, well, sort of just too the, good not to tell. I mean, yes, all these guys I've named would, would be up there at the mansion um, uh, in Holmby Hills. And um, nearly all of them were, um, uh, you know, almost slavishly admiring um, of Ben. I mean, Frank Sinatra was apparently just agog at, the, at this guy. He, you know, Frank knew the, the backstory, knew what, know, knew what Ben and Meyer had done in New York um, and admired him only the more for that. Um, George Raft was on the scene and, of course, was uh, Ben's, you know, uh, uh, best friend, really, and, and others, as I say, Gary Cooper. But Jimmy Stewart, um, uh, the first time he went there uh, with his wife, um, uh, basically turned to, to Ben and said, you know, you're just the scum of the earth. What do you think you're doing? You're just a criminal. And everybody fell silent because they thought the next thing would happen is that Ben would take out a gun and shoot him. Um, uh, but he didn't. And, and later in a memoir, uh, his wife said that, that, you know, maybe the one reason why Jimmy Stewart could, could say that and get away with it is that, first of all, he was pretty tall. And second of all, uh, no one else did that. So, um, you know, Ben was, was almost kind of fascinated. And that sort of fits a pattern because later Mickey Cohen, this, this fierce simian creature who, you know, uh, had a real reputation for violence, confronted um, Ben and refused to give him some money that he owed Ben. And Ben just laughed. He just found this uh, hilarious. And, 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 and later on, when he, when he uh, started spending time with Virginia Hill, she would challenge him. And, and he found that, that uh, amusing as well. So, so there's something in that. I think you could, you, could, you, could, you could challenge him, but you had to do it you had to do it the right way. And, and indeed, George Raft describes a, a story of uh, 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 warning a new girlfriend of, of Ben's, uh, who was an actress, um, Wendy Barry, I think was her name, became a pretty well-known actress, you know, warning her not to uh, spend time with Ben and uh, because it would ruin her career. Um, and so, and, and Wendy, instead of taking that to heart, went back to Ben and said, gee, you know, your best friend says I shouldn't hang out with you because it'll ruin my career. And about two days later, Ben comes bursting into George Raft's Coldwater Canyon house with, with two guns and, and he's about to kill his best friend. And, and um, George finally says, uh, you know, calm down, blue eyes, baby blue eyes, just calm down. And this was this, was this phrase, baby blue eyes, was somehow the phrase that could calm Ben down. Um, so he, uh, so George Raft uh, uh, survived that encounter, but but uh, but just barely. Um, well, the Hollywood stuff is it, it's really great. I mean, we could talk. There, there's just yeah. so much in there, but kind of if we're going chronologically, yeah, the next thing happens, and again. One of the things that makes this book so good is it's not just the life of Bugsy Siegel, but it's yeah. kind of the history of criminal capitalism of, of the 20th century is a little thing that came to be known as Murder, Inc. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that and how it came yes. about? And, yes. Because this, yes. Is when, this is when Ben Siegel starts to become a little less seductive and appealing and kind of becomes a stone cold killer. Yeah, I, that's... 
That's true. I would even say he was a cold stone killer back in the prohibition days when he and Meyer formed what they called the Meyer, um, uh, the Meyer and, and, and Ben mob. And, 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 and they essentially hired themselves out to kill or maim anybody that the various bootleggers wanted to see killed. Fast forward to, to the mid thirties, um, something very uh, interesting happened in the sort of annals of, uh, of gangland crime. Um, uh, the two most um, uh, powerful racketeers, um, Lepke and Shapiro, uh, were actually arrested, um, I think by Thomas Dewey, the, the, the prosecutor. And um, uh, they, they, there were a lot of crimes to throw at them, so many that uh, uh, Shapiro uh, ran away. <laughs> he just went out on the lam for about a year and finally he came back very depressed and he was thrown into prison and he was there for the rest of his life. But Lepke also went on the lam and for about two years, they did not find him. And he, you know, there were all sorts of rumors about where he was living, but he was probably living above a little dance hall in Brooklyn the whole time where one of his caretakers was Ben Siegel and, um, uh, and where um, Lepke began planning the demise of all the people who had worked for him. You know, you would have thought that if he was there in hiding, um, he would be grateful to his henchmen for keeping the secret and he would trust them. But no, he was paranoid and his reaction was the opposite. His reaction was try to kill them all. And the means by which he did this was Murder, Inc. And Murder, Inc. was basically, again, <laughs> Meyer and Ben, a little older, a little wiser, a little quicker to kill. And um, they um, they would they would take assignments from the top bosses, um, uh, Lucky Luciano and and uh, uh, Joe Dotto and others, um, and they would they would kill people uh, who were perceived as as turncoats, um, it, you know, even if it meant uh, finding them halfway across the country and killing them in the middle of the night, and. There are estimates that as many as 400 people died this way in the mid 30s. So, um, you know, Ben was part of this. Absolutely, he and Meyer were part of this. And um, finally, even they began to get sick of all the killings. You know, it's enough, these killings. We got to stop this. And so they fooled. We Lepke. need some seltzer. We need to yeah. relax. They fooled Lepke into accepting a deal. What Lepke was really worried about is that Thomas Dewey would find evidence and charge him for murder and he'd be put in the electric chair, um, uh, which by the way happened uh, eventually. But uh, at this stage, he thought if he could kill off all those guys, there wouldn't be that evidence. And um, so he asked, um, he asked uh, Ben uh, and Meyer to, to murder uh, all, the, all the henchmen they could. And it got down to really one guy, Big Harry Greenberg. Big Harry Greenberg, backstory I won't bore you with, but he was on the lam now from, um, from, from Lepke, from Ben, and he had found a little place to live in in LA under a highway, he and his wife hiding all day. Somehow his whereabouts were discovered and Ben um, set up this elaborate uh, murder scheme. Um, I'll just say this about his murder schemes. They were always more complicated than they needed to be. He just loved forming them. So at any rate, they figured out the very moment every evening that, that Big Harry came out with the newspapers and, um, and they killed him. Um, and uh, um, this time, uh, uh, Ben was really in trouble because um, uh, uh, there was a guy named Kid Twist Rellis, a whole story and a book in and of himself, who ratted on everybody. All of it, this was, this was Lepke's worst nightmare. Uh, Relis ratted on him, ratted on everyone, and uh, and on Ben as well. Um, as some of you may know, if you're mafia aficionados, Kid Twist Kid Twist Relis ended up being pushed out of a window on the sixth floor of a Coney Island hotel just before he was going to testify. All these guys, including Ben, and as a result, uh, Ben got off. The trial was dismissed. Uh, the case was dismissed, and in 1942, he started a new life, having sold his mansion, having, you know, he had to admit it, he had, he had sort of blotched his, his, his school book there. He, he had 
uh, ruined his relations with all the Hollywood stars because murdering people was just not really something they admired. Um, and what it meant is that he needed to start a new life somewhere else, and that became Las Vegas and the Flamingo. All right, before, you, before we go into Vegas, um, two things. One, this is just, I, I just like this, this connection between Hollywood and gangsters. Yeah. Abe Kid Twist uh, Relis. Yeah, you got uh, it. In the movie was, there was a great movie called Murder, Murder Inc., a really, really good movie. Yeah. And Peter Falk played yes. him. And it's what made Peter Falk a giant star playing one of the gangsters who was thrown off the roof. I think he was either nominated or actually won an Oscar. Right. But before we go to Vegas, I want you to tell one more story about this incredible mansion with which had sliding doors with guns stashed behind it and oh, yeah, escape yeah. patches. But tell this, I'd never heard this. And it was, I have to say, this is something I might have called him Bugsy. I would not have had the nerve to do what this reporter did, which is the guy's name was William Huey. Oh, yeah. Can you tell that story briefly? Because it's sure. incredible. Sure. Um, the, um, uh, the fact is that um, uh, ben, um, ben had this mansion. Uh, he invited all these people over. And while that was going on, a young uh, reporter named Bill Huey um, read about Ben in the LA papers and was intrigued, just thought he'd go um, uh, see what he could find. So rather cleverly, he arrived at the back door with a stack of magazines and newspapers saying that he was selling subscri subscriptions. And Ben happened to be off on some gambit um, in a boat uh, off Costa Rica, which I, I, I won't bore you with here. But um, uh, therefore, there was just the wife, um, Esther, who was sort of lonely. And she let him in. And soon enough, he was not just the, the newspaper guy. He was the sort of nanny for the two girls. Um, and he would take them uh, horseback riding to the stable where Elizabeth Taylor rode. And he would make their dinners for them. It was Christmas. He did the Christmas tree. And then uh, uh, on about January 2nd, Back comes Ben from his from his various travels, and Hoy was was horrified, thought that he was going to be found out immediately and killed, but he stuck with it, and for about a week he lived with Ben and Ben's wife and kids as Ben held these you know midnight meetings with other gangsters, um, and uh, uh, it, it's really great color. He 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 would hang out talking to Ben's father, who by now had retired from the press, the pants pressing factory and was being supported by his son, no doubt causing more conflicting feelings. Um, and and uh, Hoy uh, got a lot uh, of, of good color for the story he was gonna write um, and was lucky enough to get out just in time. But he also snuck into his office, into Ben Siegel's office at night and yeah went through papers and took papers and yeah got yeah, and, he, and, he, and, and and got gambling connections that no one knew about and things like right. that right it was it was it was great reporting it was uh, uh, but and and very risky because it was it, the, the floors were carpeted <laughs> and I remember this detail and at any time you know someone even just another servant could have come around and seen him rummaging through these files but he uh, according to him he got away with all this uh, and a few days after he left, uh, claiming that his mother was sick in Arizona or something, um, the cops came to, to the mansion door and, um, uh, and Ben sort of gave them this one-sided smile and he said, so did you bring uh, Bill, you know, Huey with you? <laughs> and, and clearly he had figured out in those three, three days that this guy was who he was and that um, and, and, and I think it's fair to say that Bill Hoy might not have survived if he'd stuck around another week. Yeah, I would say definitely. <laughs> so, okay, so now it's time to go to the thing that everybody remembers him yes. for. Let's go to Vegas. Yeah. Well, um, you know, uh, Ben had been uh, intrigued by casinos uh -huh. for quite a while. As you probably know, 1931 was the big year in, in Nevada when everything became legal from, from any kind of gambling to prostitution, to marriage, you know, quickie marriages, quickie divorces. 
Um, and you know, Ben could see um, Ben could see promise in that, um, but he didn't really get to it until the early '40s, um, uh, when he you know just beat the rap for for Big Harry. Um, what he started doing to sort of educate himself was to muscle in on all the little small casinos. They called them the the wagon wheel and sawdust ca casinos. But that gave him this idea that what he really wanted was to create his own far larger casino uh, that he would call a carpet joint. Instead of sawdust, carpet. This was the definition of class. Um, and so he tried to buy um, the, the large, either of the largest major casinos uh, and neither was, one was not for sale. One eventually was, he bought that one. Um, but neither one of them fulfilled his dream. He wanted his own place. And so the story goes, and it's actually um, recounted beautifully in the movie, the Bugsy movie that uh, uh, Barry Levinson um, uh, uh, directed. And um, I'm told he may be with us tonight. So hello, if, if you are. Uh, it's a wonderful movie. I edited and, his novel, by the way, if you sir. What's that? I edited Barry Levinson's novel. So I ah, hope there we go. Um, anyway, it was either Ben or Meyer Lansky, they both took credit, who first saw this uh, open plot of, uh, of land uh, just south of Las Vegas, with tumbleweeds, you know, and, 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 and Ben would say for the rest of his life that it was his, um, you know, insight that this could be the, the, um, the flamingo. Um, as for why, by the way, the, the flamingo uh, many theories, uh, uh, one of them that, uh, that he and Meyer liked to hang out in Florida watching the flamingos down there, another that it had to do with certain um, sexual capabilities on the part of Virginia Hill, that the list goes on. But the flamingo it was, and um, uh, Ben convinced the Eastern mob, uh, his pals, um, that, he could, um, that he could do this on a couple million dollars, which is a lot of money at that time. Um, but as the months went on, it became clear that the, the, the sums would far out, uh, exceed that because Ben didn't know what he was doing. Um, he thought he knew what he was doing. He even brought in a, a wonderful character of the times named Billy Wilkerson, who, who had started restaurants in LA like Ciro's. And he had a waxed mustache and he, he liked wearing tails. And he was a very elegant guy, almost a, you know, a caricature. Um, but he really knew how to design the inside of a, of, of a restaurant, or in this case, a casino. But of course, only weeks after Ben came onto the project himself and, and, and hired Billy Wilkerson, he decided, Ben decided that Wilkerson was a jerk and couldn't do anything and, and Ben would do it all himself. The result being that everybody took advantage of him. And when the supply trucks came in you know, through the gate, um, they would give him the paperwork, he would give it back, and then two hours later, they'd come right around with the same stuff in the back of their truck and do it again. And, and he was too either bugsy or oblivious to, to realize he was being um, handled like that. So it took uh, eventually $6 million before this casino was, was finished, in, in, uh, almost finished by early 1946. And of course, by now, um, uh, uh, Ben's uh, uh, former uh, admiring cohorts were apoplectic. Um, they, they'd seen their money evaporate. In fact, they thought it was worse than that. They had begun to suspect that Virginia Hill, who is, merits a book on her own, uh, and has gotten a couple, um, that Virginia was skimming. And they thought that she had been a terrible influence on Ben and that he too was skimming. Well, you don't do that. You can't, that's one rule you can't break in, in mob land. Um, so there was a meeting held, a very famous meeting in, in December uh, in Havana. And all the, you know, Lucky Luciano on down were all there to discuss a few things, but the biggest issue um, was Ben Siegel and what to do about him uh, because the Flamingo had still not opened and it was still just gushing money. And so the conclusion was basically that Ben had gone too far and he was gonna get killed. Why he didn't get killed then in the next few weeks, I don't know, but maybe it was because people wanted to hope that, um, that, the, uh, that, that, the, that the Flamingo would open in time and, and would, get, would get them some of their money back. It did open, it was a fiasco. This is 
December 1946. Um, so much so that Ben actually closed it down for three months, tried to fix it up, get everything done, and then reopened uh, in, in March and actually uh, finally began making some money uh, and thought probably that he was in the clear, that even if his buddies had been talking about killing him, they would feel fine once they were making money. And he felt that right up to the night of June 20th, 1947, uh, when he was shot to death. Clearly, he was wrong. <laughs> um, before you go into your theories, which, as I told you earlier, I thought were just really smart and interesting about how he was actually killed, because it has never been totally solved or proven. Um, talk a little bit about Virginia Hill, who is an extraordinarily interesting and kind of equally crazy character. Yeah, fascinating character. Well, in brief, she was born a very poor, but beautiful girl in, in a little town called Bessemer, Alabama. Um, she ends up going to Chicago with the World's Fair on that year. She ingratiates herself with the mob, the Chicago mob. She becomes a, you know, a, a bag lady, not, not in that sense, but I mean, tr entrusted with bags of cash, lettuce, they called it. And somehow uh, she, met, um, uh, she met Ben, uh, and actually, the first person she met was an accountant named Joe Epstein, who was an older guy, sort of, you know, heavy set guy who just adored her and basically supported her for, for years. Anyway, in the early 40s, um, uh, Virginia met Ben uh, and Ben uh, was was absolutely besotted with her, not just because she was beautiful and sexy, as all accounts agree, but because, um, as I started to say earlier, she was completely um, unintimidated by him um, and he loved that. Um, so they became a very, very intense uh, couple. Um, and Virginia, uh, once the Flamingo started getting built, she um, uh, couldn't resist becoming part of the, uh, the, the staff designing in fact, the whole casino in what most people say was a very garish way. Um, and um, uh, it, it's unclear whether she really loved Ben um, uh, 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 or if part of this was just the uh, excitement of being involved in this project and the money that flowed in. Hard to say. What's more interesting though is what happened after, after Ben uh, died. Um, she had uh, decided out of the blue a month before to go to Paris. Um, and she'd never been there. She was 29 years old, she'd never been to Paris, and she took 75 fur coats with her. Why she needed them in Paris in, in early summer, anybody's guess. Uh, she was there in Paris, uh, leaving Ben the free reign of her mansion um, on Linden Avenue, uh, Linden Drive, and um, uh, she found herself hanging out with this champagne family, the Fouillettes, whatever the names are. And um, meanwhile, back in, in, in LA, Ben was trying desperately to raise more money for the, for the Flamingo. And he was living in her house. Uh, she had given them the golden key that fit the lock, literally. And, um, uh, and so then he's killed. Um, there were all sorts of suspects, um, including some of the people who worked for Ben, um, including the race wire guys who were really angry at him because he'd been taking, um, uh, who had been taking uh, uh, money from, from their profits and the race wire and these various, and also Virginia Hill's own uh, younger brother, Chick, um, was a likely suspect because um, uh, in recent months, uh, ben and Virginia had become more and more um, acrimonious with each other. And it was possibly some physical abuse that Chick would have been, uh, would have wanted to try to, to stop. Um, but then there's also the possibility that, that Meyer Lansky or his people, um, you know, did the job as promised back there in Havana. Um, my own theory is, of course, like any theory, completely um, impossible to substantiate, but um, but Nick Pileggi thinks I may be right. So uh, he, the great uh, writer about 
about Mob, Mob's the uh, the go the good fella um, writer, uh, a, a, a agree to some extent with what I feel, which is that um, uh, Virginia knew that uh, uh, Ben was going to be killed because he had skimmed, um, and he uh, it was only the question of who would kill him. If some hired gun killed Ben, um, then uh, Virginia would still be on the list to be killed herself because she had skimmed money and it was in Switzerland uh, and the mob wanted that money back. But if she had been able to say to Joe Dodo and, and Lucky Luciano and the others, I can set this up so that Ben, you know, is out of the picture if you'll let me keep my money in Switzerland. And so what gives some credence to that is that when mafia guys hit, you know, kill other mafia guys, it's either, it's, it's with a gun, it's with a handgun. It's never with a rifle, um, as Pelleggi pointed out, never with a rifle. Or they'd take someone out to the desert and bury him there, you know. But Ben was killed that night with a rifle. And Chick, Virginia's younger brother, had just come back from the military where he specialized in um, automatic rifles. In training. And so I think, uh, I think that, um, uh, that the mob uh, used Virginia's help to, to have someone, maybe Chick himself, maybe someone else, uh, kill Ben. And Virginia, as a result, was able to go free. And I'll just conclude by saying a sort of poignant, she didn't really go free. She was tormented by guilt. And she tried to kill herself on at least six occasions with sleeping pills uh, until finally she was in the town of Closters, Switzerland, and she managed to succeed in killing herself. To me, this is part of the, the theory uh, that she may have realized, I mean, she obviously, if, this, if, if I'm right, she knew she had traded Ben's life for her own. And that might've been a very difficult thing for anybody to live with, especially someone who had actually loved him. So and before you have questions, I, I will just say to, to come full circle with the Hollywood and gangster connections. So I'm sure everyone watching and listening has seen The God, Godfather yeah. and the way Mo Green was killed, yes. which was shot through the eye. It is exactly the way Ben Siegel was killed, shot in the eye. In, in and a truly the way Michael describes it, it's rather gruesome. Well, but, it is, uh, you're, I'm glad you, you, you raised that, Peter, because there's no doubt that, um, that Coppola took that from, from uh, the shooting of- uh, Oh, had to have. Ben. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, in fact, the, the real life shooting of Ben Siegel um, was done with nine shots from a turbine or a, a rifle right behind him. That person was standing outside and, um, um, uh, and, and in fact, he was shot through the eye. One of the, one of the five shots actually did go through his eye to the extent that uh, it actually was propelled to the opposite wall. And we know this <laughs> because a gossip columnist named um, Flora Bill Muir, I think her name was, um, uh, got to the house first before any other journalist and measured the distance between him lying on the Davenport and the eye that, that was pinned to the other wall. It's a rough business. <laughs> and on that note, we should start taking questions. <laughs> I'm still stuck on a hardcore gangster dropping water balloons onto Park Avenue. That's, right. <laughs> that's right. the photo that's gonna uh, stick with me, I think. Uh, um, so we, we have co covered a lot of ground. Um, but we have some questions from the audience and I encourage anyone who still has questions to uh, send them to us in the chat. But the first one I think we'll start with this evening is from Laura. Laura asks, what was the most enjoyable part of researching or writing the book? And what was the most challenging part of researching and writing the book? Um, well, that's, um, that's a good question. Um, one of the most uh, enjoyable aspects was uh, spending a day um, with uh, uh, Wendy, um, uh, Ben Siegel's granddaughter, but hearing some of the family stories. 
she herself, uh, I mean, Ben had died before she was born. So, I mean, it, it, you know, but there was family lore nonetheless. And I, I enjoyed that. I actually have to say one of my favorite experiences was discovering this wonderful biography um, of Bugsy um, by a guy named Dean Jennings. And it was called, uh, We Only Shoot Each Other. <laughs> And um, uh, Dean Jennings was a kind of shoe leather, you know, tabloid kind of reporter um, who was resourceful enough back in the mid 60s to interview some of the people who were so important in this story, like George Raft um, or indeed like Virginia's brother, Chick. All that, those wonderful anecdotes, they only come the, from one place, which is Dean Jennings, who, who was, uh, you know, to whom I felt incredibly grateful because he he wrote them uh, in his his biography. So, I mean, I think it's you know you're talking about a guy who uh, who died uh, whatever seventy years ago, whatever it is, um, who who obviously didn't write his own story, who uh, about whom stories were written, which may have been apocryphal. So you know, uh, there's a lot uh, that's hard to pin down, um, but all the more reason why that that uh, colorful biography, which was also very well written, um, you know, did some of that pinning down for me. You do a very good job, by the way, of giving different sides to the same story when there are different sides. So even the discovery of the, Flam the site for the Flamingo Hotel, you, you kind of make it sound like it's a psychotic high school because everybody wants credit for doing, you know, finding the site for building Vegas. Um, yes, yes. So, but you do a good job of showing here are the different possibilities. Here's what I think. Yeah, well, um, certainly that, that moment of, of seeing this land of 33 acres out there, um, uh, you know, was, uh, uh, was a moment that, um, you know, it's, it, it, success is a thousand fathers, right? I mean, it, for Lansky to have claimed vehemently later that it was his idea, for Ben to have said the same, and indeed for Billy Wilkerson, the guy with the, you know, wax mustache, they all claimed that they had the idea first. Um, and it's fun to give them each their, uh, their voices. We have another question from Hillary. Beyond your wonderful anecdotes, what was the moral or historical arc of Bugsy's life? Why ultimately was he important to history? Great question. Um, well, the um, the thing that, that first comes to mind is that you know he did, uh, despite all the cost overruns, etc. Uh, he really does get credit, I think, for um, building the Flamingo and thus for creating not just the first large casino in Vegas, because there were a couple of those before, but the sort of first Monaco style elegant casino hotel uh, um, uh, where not only was there, you know, 24 hour gambling, but there was great entertainment. I mean, you know, people like Lena Horne or Harry Belafonte. Um, uh, and the, you know, the money that he spent, I mean, he could spend thousands of dollars on a, on a, you know, first rate entertainer there for the weekend. Um, but that was the sort of thing which gave the Flamingo, uh, it's Elan, it's, it's frisson and, uh, and, and made it succeed. So I think he, you know, when you go to Vegas, you see all those other places and every one of them has a show in a funny way, all of those places, um, I have a legacy, uh, a, a, a debt to, to, uh, to Ben. But just for a moment, the other part of your question is why, you know, what else can we say about him uh, in, in the nature of sort of a legacy? Um, I think that, um, you know, he, like these other Jewish gangsters, he really did try to um, uh, earn his way out of, um, of gangsterdom um, and, um, you know, to, to try to seize, um, as I say, the, you know, the American dream in its own way. I think he, I think he deserves some, some sympathy or at least interest for that. Um, but I will also say this, um, and it, it, this didn't occur to me till, till after the book was done, but you can say some positive things about Ben. You can say he was charming, dapper, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, loyal, actually. I think you could say he was loyal to, to his, 
uh, member family mobsters and, and, and in a sense to his wife. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, this is a guy who did business with a gun. And it's not really that um, ultimately uh, heroic uh, or acceptable, um, remotely so, um, to, you know, to kill people to get get done what you want to do. And, and, and in fact, I would say it's cowardliness. I mean, um, uh, but it is part of, you know, it's, it's, it's cowardly and yet it's part of this Jewish American time and period. Um, and so for that too, he's, I think he, you know, has a message for us. And it's part of the whole wild west culture that America was reared on basically. Yeah. Yeah, it, absolutely. The, you know, it is a wild west thing. It's going from the Lower East Side out to LA and, and, and just embracing the, uh, the whole uh, uh, China ethos. He, we were saying this earlier, um, Peter, but he, he loved to describe himself in LA as a sportsman. That was, that's, that's what he was. And, and, and so if you asked him, what's a sportsman? He would say somebody who went to the track, someone who entertains, someone who, uh, you know, I don't know, whatever. Um, whereas in fact, a, a sportsman in, in, in real definition was someone who um, muscled in on uh, nightclubs and restaurants, who um, uh, killed people who got in his way. Um, that, that, that was the kind of sportsman he really was. And lest we forget that we are talking about a criminal. A question from Kenneth. Are there stories of Ben and Meyer killing people by having them drink lye? I don't, yikes. I don't know about that. All I know is that there were a few uh, people uh, quoted in various um, books of the time um, who described Ben as someone who was kind of, um, kind of sick in the sense that he actually took pleasure in doing these hits himself and in you know terrifying the people who were about to die um, um, it's funny that that can if that's true I mean again how much do we know is true we don't but you know if that's true how curious that in the end we still sort of find him a sympathetic uh, character someone, who intrigues us. Um, there's a, a review in the Times last Friday and the, and the reviewer who's a, a great authority on the subject said, you know, at the end of this story, one is almost inclined to say, to, to, to feel sadness, to feel sad that this man has died. And, and, and I, I suppose it's, you know, there is something to that. And it also just suggests his, um, his ability to charm um, and, and how, how far that got him. Uh, we have another question here. Um, despite Warren Beatty's Bugsy, do you feel there could be Hollywood interest in your book as a series perhaps? <laughs> uh, yes, if we could meet in the corner after this. Uh... <laughs> no, I uh, actually, I, I, I do think there is a, uh, uh, a, a different uh, movie from the one uh, which Barry Levinson did so beautifully. He focused on the whole, you know, the last part of Ben's life, the Flamingo and Virginia Hill and, and all that quite sensibly. I think there's a whole other story movie in his, his, his youth and his friendship with Meyer Lansky. Um, and I find it fascinating, as I said before, that Meyer may have either actually killed his lifetime friend because of the rule that he'd broken, or at the very least, um, sanction someone else to do the work. Um, and that's, you know, that's an amazing relationship. And, and they, you know, from, from the moment they met at that, that fight, you know, with a gun in the Lower East Side, uh, until Ben actually did die, these guys were incredibly close all the time. And, um, uh, and of course, also um, criminals all the time. And I, uh, that's a movie I'd like to see. So, well, there's we haven't had a chance to talk. There are so many other things in this book that in an hour you can't really talk about. But one of the things that's so interesting too, 
he and Meyer Lansky, and I guess more than the others, even Lucky Luciano, also basically came up with the idea of the mafia families. Yeah. And you write about that. And, and it's it really is one of the reasons, not just Vegas, but he, they kind of created the whole structure of modern, the modern mob. They, they did. Absolutely, Peter. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, um, you know, there before these those guys took over, there was what they called the War of the Mustache Peets. And the Mustache Peets were these guys from Sicily and Italy who'd come over. Actually, they'd been banished by Mussolini, of all things. And they came over and each side was, you know, trying to extinguish the other side. Eventually, so many of them were killed that, that, that they all kind of slunk off. And, um, uh, and Lucky Luciano was clever enough to, um, to take over and, and even more so not to try to be, to set himself up as the boss of bosses. He was, but he didn't say so. What he did was to create these families and to, um, to create this idea of a syndicate that was kind of, uh, you know, uh, crony capitalism or crime capitalism, if you will. Um, and by, uh, um, allocating power among the families. It kept them uh, satisfied and, and kept Luciano in control. So that absolutely did help uh, uh, establish the, the, the structure uh, of, of, of gangland crime, along with, of course, what, what the Italian mafia was doing as well. It was all about making money, um, as, as one of them, I forget which one said, you know, it's just about the money. <laughs> which I guess ultimately it was. So we're still getting a lot of questions in from the audience. I'm going to pose two more to you, Michael, before we wrap up here this evening. Mm -hmm. um, we have one from Eileen. Michael, you've written one of the very best books in the Jewish, Jewish Live series and put your gangster right up there with Marx, Freud, and Einstein. Oh. If I remember correctly, Bugsy gave to the UJA, the United Jewish Appeal Federation, unusual for a murderer to also be a philanthropist. Right. What was up with that? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Eileen. Eileen uh, is my editor and uh, had the idea for this book and um, has been a great supporter. And that, that, that's very touching to hear from her. I appreciate it. Um, yes, well, actually, um, all the gangsters gave money, um, uh, especially right after the war, um, to the state of Israel. I mean, they were as horrified by the Holocaust as anybody. And um, so one day, Ben is sitting in Ciro's restaurant, the one that was started by Billy Wilkerson, the guy with the wax mustache. Um, when this, uh, when he gets a call from from this, uh, what turns out to be this Israeli military officer. And uh, the guy comes around to make a pitch, essentially a fundraising pitch, to help uh, raise money to uh, establish the state of Israel. And, um, and, and Ben hears him out for a while, and then he leans forward and he says, let me just ask you something. Is this just going to be one of these kind of like PR campaigns where, um, you know, you give a little money uh, to the synagogue? And the guy says, no. Nope. I, I'm a, an army officer and uh, what we're engaged with here is whatever it takes to get our land. And, and Ben says, you mean, uh, you mean you'd kill people? And, and, and the, the military guy says, yes, we would. And Ben says, okay, you got my money and gives him a big <laughs> paper bag of money. And for each of the next 10 weeks that this military guy was in and around Hollywood raising money from the studio heads, the end of every week, a big paper bag of money would come to him from Ben Siegel. Um, so yes, there was a sense of, uh, of philanthropy, um, uh, 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 although it's also true to say that um, uh, by the time Ben became sort of became a philanthropist, he wasn't earlier on, <laughs> he had other things on his mind, uh, but, but in the last months, there was, I think, a, a poignant sense um, uh, an awareness that he might not be living too long and maybe he ought to try to do some some good to atone. Um, so he actually sponsored a couple um, fundraisers, one uh, for Eddie Cantor, one for another actor of the day who was doing that sort of thing. And only later did I realize that the timing of, of those two events was was poignant. It was just as his father died. The father who had spent his whole life working in the factory on the pants presser who had never earned any money, 
died um, in, in about April of 1947. And um, uh, my sense is that, that Ben was, you know, giving this money as a kind of uh, tribute to his father, uh, maybe a way of sort of resolving those conflicted feelings between a, uh, a mob son and, and the mob's, mob, mob son's father. Um, and um, so, so he did do that, but there was a certain insanity to it at that point because he had, you know, he had spent so much money on, on the Flamingo that to, you know, to give 50 or hundred thousand um, dollars when, when millions were still needed to, to, to put the thing into operating order, um, the, the, it, 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 was, it was a kind of crazy thing to do. And a final question now from Francis. It sounds like Ben charmed you, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Did your feeling about him change during the course of your writing? Um, yeah, I, I, I never stopped liking him. Um, I wrote a book about Andrew Cuomo. I stopped liking him. Um, <laughs> but I, th I think that Ben was... Um, I mean, he was complex. He was, he was, there was a, a, a kind of earnest ambition about him, even if it was tinged with a terrible temper and the, and the, uh, uh, the capacity for, for killing someone. I think, I think he really uh, had that ambition in a way that I found sort of unexpectedly admirable. Um, and, and, you know, let's not forget at the end of the day, there was the Flamingo, this fabulous, first of its kind, glamorous hotel casino, which really uh, had an enormous impact on the whole state, let alone the sort of gambling culture of the world. Um, so, uh, so yes, so I, I liked him. Uh, would, I, would I have dinner with him? Maybe just a drink? Um, <laughs> anyway. You did mention Ratners. I did mention Ratners. Oh, oh, but not enough. Um, if, if you all have one more minute here, I meant to say this earlier, that one of the, one of the murders that, um, one of the hits that, that Meyer and Ben tried to uh, commit was against a guy who was uh, moving furs for them, only it turned out he was stealing the furs. So they did the classic thing. They put him in the back of a car and said, we're going on a, on a ride down this dark road. And the guy's name was John Barrett, knew what fate held for him. So at about 40 miles an hour, he opens the door of this car, flies out, starts zigzagging down the road. The car comes to a screeching halt. They take out their Tommy guns. They begin firing him. He gets hit four times, but somehow manages to, um, to escape them and to, to slink into the governor hospital, which is down in the Lower East Side. And the next morning, Meyer and Ben went to... Ratners <laughs> to talk it all over. And according to someone, I think I read in that Dean Jennings bio, you know, Meyer says, um, oh, you missed the party. It was such fun. <laughs> <laughs> and the fun was that they almost shot him dead. So what, what, a, what, a, what a scene it must have been in Ratners uh, on, on an average uh, weekday morning. Well, by the you way, know, I grew up hearing these stories because my grandfather owned Ratner's and all my aunts and uncles worked there and kind of ran it. And when I was a little boy, they would all tell stories of Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel and eight or nine other Jewish gangsters, all, all of whom to me had hilarious names because you never <laughs> thought of Jews as tough Jews. And, um, you know, it was all Bugsy Siegel and, you know, King Kong Klein, and it just really tickled me. And they, all the waiters and all my relatives said Bugsy Siegel and Meyer Lansky would come in, have breakfast, plot what they were going to do, their nefarious deeds, go out, commit crimes and kill people, and then come back for lunch and talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> so it's all true. Yeah, well, that's that's a great place to end, I think. And, and thank you all for for coming, for listening. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Peter, for uh, sharing your evening with us. 
Um, I know it's not the Flamingo or Ratners, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I hope you all had fun with us this evening. Uh, great. And don't thank forget, you. And don't oh, forget thank you so much. Uh, thank you all. Bugsy right. Siegel, links are in the chat. And you all have a lovely evening. Take care, everyone. Right. Thank you. Will do.